Millions of Nigerians headed back to the polls as Africa's most populous nation held gubernatorial elections amid tensions after February 25th's disputed presidential elections. Today, we know that the Labour Party and its candidate Peter Obi formally filed a petition at the Election Petition Tribunal in Abuja, challenging the declaration of Bola Ahmed Tinubu of the All Progressives Congress as the winner of the presidential elections. The petitioners are praying for the tribunal to declare that Tinubu was not duly elected by a majority of the lawful votes cast at the election. They want an order mandating INEC to retrieve the certificates of return issued to the APC candidate and issue a fresh one to Obi. What should have been another opportunity for voters to exercise their franchise has been soured by violent attacks, ballot box snatching, delays, and more tainted governorship and state election results across the country. And so, we continue to see what the aftermath holds. Kunle Lawal, Executive Director of the Electoral College Nigeria, joins me now to look at what next. Kunle, welcome again to Politics HQ. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much, Tulu. It's always a pleasure. So when we look at how the events of Saturday played out for the governorship and the National Assembly elections, and of course how INEC was meant to take the complaints and criticisms from the presidential elections to do better, what really was at stake in the conduct of the elections that held this weekend? Okay, so um, I think one of the key critical things to note was at least um, INEC paid attention to logistics, which I see it seems like the only thing they got right. Um, I think it's popular knowledge that the lower the election, the higher the fracas. Mm. So if you want the worst thing happening, reduce the level of, uh, in the election. Um, now what was seen in hotspots like um, Lagos, um, Rivers, uh, and other states, especially states that had an incumbent governor running. The only peaceful state that had an incumbent running was Oyo State. Yes, with Shea uh, Makinde. Yes, with Shea Makinde's race. But every other one that had an incumbent um, governor running was not quite as peaceful as we thought it was. I'm a proponent, and I've said this, I think, earlier, and I've, I'm not sure where I was here. I'm a proponent of Nigeria staggering its election. I heard the conversation a little earlier. And, it was talk and he was talking about this, uh, the security issues within the election. And being honest, um, this is 928,000 kilometers of country. Mm. We cannot, we don't have the security power, about 400,000, less than two policemen per polling unit. Yes. You can't, you can't conduct an election in Nigeria. It's easier for president because there you have like 460, um, 460 system. positions available for election. Mm -hmm. But now coming to the gubernatorial election, you're talking of over 9,000 positions available for grabs. It's, it's going to be a dog eat dog world. I'm, I'm, I'm still of, and I, I remain a proponent of Nigeria staggering its elections to suit it, probably four states. You know, we saw four states, we go to the next four states or six states. But I, I think that's what INEC can handle because it's clearly showing that it's kind of hard to pull a, a general election in Nigeria. Okay, so I want to look at a few things that the European Union Observation Mission Nigeria noted in its second preliminary report and the, uh, the comment about incumbent governors has brought this up. So it noted that there was obstruction and organized violence which limited the free expression of the will of the voters despite efforts by civil society to promote democratic standards. We also saw voters in 15 out of 28 states benefit from professionally organized media debates during which journalists asked questions and fact checkers were able to probe their response. The statement also noted that in several states, the abuse of incumbency gave an undue advantage to the party in power. And also noted that disinformation contaminated the online information space and contributed to confusing voters with damaging rhetoric aimed at fermenting ethnic divisions uh, was something that the um, EU observation team also observed. So when you look at what the report is saying, and I know you and your team also had uh, observers, observers on the field for the elections this past weekend, do these things align? Are these some of the things that we will now see end up defining the elections that held on Saturday? I must commend the EU and its observation mission. They also um, came to visit us at the office and still were, came by the situation room that the Electoral College had in conjunction with the CJID. Um, I agree with the EU on all fronts, but I, I also love the language they use. Mm. Um, they tempered it down uh, b because they are the EU. But I, I, I will say this clearly. Um, we took ourselves from, two, in these elections, we took ourselves from 2023 straight into 1965. Mm. That far back. Preceding the Civil War. Wow. And, you know, uh, this ethnic rhetoric 
brings the biggest thing to my mind, which I've always spoken about. I remember while I, my, I was in politics in 2019, one of the key things I spoke about was um, the change of state of origin to state of residence. Um, I don't think anybody should pay their taxes in any particular state and should not be part of the governing system or part of the, those who decide what happens in that place. I think our ancestral value to a particular place or land it has lost its value. But coming back to the elections, um, the EU got one thing very right. The disinformation available in this conversation was very high. Mm. Abuse of power of incumbency, which you know I spoke about earlier, was, was off the charts. Now, it went as far as, and this is new, and you know, in Nigeria, once we start a culture which we have decided to buy into, it becomes the tradition in it the next the election. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing was incumbents not attending debates. This was new, and this was across board. And I, I didn't get why that was done. And they were explained because one candidate was there, or because, you know, a flimsy excuse that didn't hold weight. And I think that, We've, 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 we've got ourselves drunk in Nigeria by, um, by, uh, in support of who we think can win mm. more than who actually can do the job. Okay, so I, I like you asking who we think can win versus who we think can do the job because there's also some disparate conversations happening along the outcome of the process versus the process itself, the credibility of the process. And I know I've seen you sort of tweet about this and also raise this question. So Kule, should we be focusing on the outcome as being possibly problematic or the process itself that brings about the outcome? I, I love this. Uh, <laughs> I love the fact <laughs> you asked me this question. <laughs> I, I was surprised you noted that. So um, the problem in Nigeria is that we're always concerned about the outcome. The chairman of INEC, of course, is very concerned about the outcome. I've produced a president. I'll let everybody go home. No, that's not what it's about. The process is more important than the outcome. Mm. And what, what, were the, what were the mistakes in the process first? And there were a lot of mistakes. The Electoral Act first states that um, every political party must provide electronic and manual register for all its members. None of the 18 political parties did that. So why is that a problem? Because it's a requisite for them to go into Congress. None of them did that. They brought spots. They will bring for one state. They will bring for... And INEC allowed. And INEC allowed. Um, there's, there's, there's a clear statement that um, you cannot cross spending so, um, some amounts mm -hmm. of money. Spending limits, yes. Yes. But guess what? Everybody crossed it. I'm sure even the primaries. We all know of the reign of dollars that are covered in, in the primaries. INEC kept quiet. Now, there's a statute which clearly states that no, mem uh, no, no state media or state apparatus, state apparatus now refers to, and we would love to see the Supreme Court talk about this because they must interpret it correctly. No state apparatus has the ability to support a, co a, candidate. a candidate. We had a minister, a serving minister, a campaign spokesman. We had a DG of uh, Abiga Dabri who um, uh, supporting a candidate. Their office doesn't allow it. it mean, they can be party members, but subtly, because their office represents It's bigger the than them. They are appointed executive, not elected executive. And mm. there's a difference. So if INEC allowed all these things go on, what was INEC expecting? So in, in terms of allowing this go on, because you talk about how we accept abnormal things and then they become the norm, what do you think we might anticipate in 2027 if these issues are not addressed now? They were not addressed in real time. They were not addressed in the lead up to the elections. And now we're leaving and people are saying, okay, let's move on. We have a candidate. It's time to move on. It's time to heal. If we don't address them now, what do you think the, the, the amplification of them would be in 2027? First, there will be no debates. We have already, in 2023, succeeded in introducing dollars into our primaries, not even Naira, for the first time. We used to keep to our currency. <laughs> and now we've even changed the game. Even it was very game. big bags. Yes. No, it's very, no problem, but it was our currency. Now we've shifted the game to dollars. Mm. And um, this will continue in 2023. Um, a certain governor introduced something very interesting when he started uh, digging into roads and taking out things in Kogi State. Yes. I'm sure a lot of incumbent governors will buy into we'll that very that. intelligent, um, intelligent, dastardly act of, of doing that. And, and, you know, goes down the line. So, of course, you're going to see a lot of disrespect to... If, if these ethnic slurs were not stopped now, or somebody didn't pay any consequence, it's what's going to play in 2027. 
and by mm -hmm. then it probably has had time to simmer and bubble, bubble even more. Yes. All right, so let's talk about apathy because there's also a debate about whether or not it was voter apathy at play on Saturday. The, no, the numbers were lower, and we can continue the discussion as to why uh, out of 87 point something million Nigerians who collected their PVCs, the turnout was maybe around 31, 30 something percent. But instead of apathy, some have said that what we saw was voter disenfranchisement, voter intimidation, voter fear, and even voter disillusionment rather than just apathy. What do you think? Yes, um, so I, I, I can say probably, give or take, the numbers that came out to participate, that's for governorship elections, mm -hmm. are higher than any governorship election that we've ever had. That but doesn't now, say here, so much. No, no, I said came out. I didn't say voted. Okay. There are two different things. So came out, but disenfranchised, probably chased, uh, ballot papers destroyed. We had multiple po uh, polling units this happened. Then in some cases, the... Annex staff just didn't come to the polling units. Yet, the results were declared for those polling units. Now, that's highly intelligent. Suspicious. And this, this is across Nigeria. Uh, this, so you ask yourself, what exactly is going on? Why, why do these things occur? And we've never, if we, if we allow them, like you said, if we allow this particular set of things, Shema, we're going to get into a problem. So our problems are no more voter apathy. Mm. which was just war, what it was, because, but massively voter suppression. And that, I think if we don't deal with voter suppression, I don't think anybody will want to. I, I don't think we'll be able to get 10 million voters in 2027. That's just me being afraid. It might be a little bit more, but, but you can see presidential election is lower than Nigeria has ever had, 24 million. That's really bad. And when you bring up the presidential, it makes me ask, someone did win very clearly, uh, according to INEC, but the amount of people who ended up voting for him to win is one that many people are concerned with. So it becomes a situation of, are you president of all? And then when you come down to the governorship level, are you a governor that embraces all people in your state? Which takes me to the violence, the ethnic dialogue that we've seen in the past few weeks leading up to this um, election. The voters weren't the only victims. We saw officials of ANEC abducted, harassed, and threatened as more. But when you look at the level of violence that we saw in this election, we look at the ethnic bigotry and the tirades and, and sort of the words and the, and the uh, tones used in the past few weeks. What do you think that tells us about where we are as a country? Well, it says one thing clearly. We've built a culture around politics of intimidation. Now, I was shocked that even in Lagos, Lagos will go ahead to even have a, a traditional festival on an election day. Well, they're lucky I'm not president. I would have considered that high treason. Mm. And, and this is being honest. And, and people argue it's your native, all of a sudden, your native is All important. of a sudden, we all, all remember sudden, traditional worshippers. All of a sudden. Mm. No, you can't do that. Nobody will allow um, something like that happen if, if it came from any of the top two, uh, the two major religions. So. You ask yourself the question that as we've continued on this path, where exactly are we headed as a country? Uh, we are not, we are not getting better with um, anything else. So you, you get to ask this question now. Why are people disenfranchised? Because you have the feeling they will not vote for you or a political party you support. If you take that right away uh, from people, what we have is no more a democracy. What we have, I would, in the best way, describe rotational communism. So my previous guest did mention a bit about um, some of the arrests we've seen, and let's talk about that. So from, Friday, uh, from Saturday's election, in Bielsa, someone was arrested for seizing and destroying voting materials. The Nigeria Drug Law Enforcement Agency said that four party agents were intercepted in Ogun State in possession of multiple credit cards with the intent to buy votes. The Economic Financial uh, Crimes Commission said it had over 65 arrests in cases of voter inducement. And then the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission also arrested four suspects uh, for vote buying in Sokoto and Katsina State. We have laws against violence that don't have anything to do with elections. It's just simply being violent and being thugs. We have laws about vote buying, voter inducement, all those things. But they simply don't seem to deter those who are involved. Cycle after cycle, we see these activities. Why are we failing to deter those who get involved in election violence and election malpractices? And what do we do to change that? Because it has yet again been something that this election is tagged with. Well, it's, it seems um, the new Electoral Act is beautiful on this. Well, I think the, the Act needs a little amendment. 
So I think we should get to a point where if you are found inducing anything, your party or your candidate or receive an automatic minus of 10,000 votes. Wow. I think if we do that per one person court, we'll end this. That's the only, if we do not take drastic, so I don't believe in, there are no laws in America that are like that. Nigeria is not America. Mm. We have to have laws that suit our own culture. Cultural context. So if, if you, I think if you do that, nobody will try it because if you try it, Nobody talks. We just carry the guy to the cell. Uh, you're working for this party. We, we already know you're working for this party. You just minus. I need to calculate everything. And they'll say, we caught 10 people minus 100,000 votes. Everybody will sit up. But parties and candidates will tell you <coughs> they've never met some of these people even doing some of this violence. They're not directing them to do this violence. They've never had conversations with them saying, this is what I want you to do. How do you punish them for the actions of people who feel like they're doing them a favor? Oh, so yes, you've never met them. I agree. It's possible in politics. But you gain off the things they do. Mm. And you're okay with the game. And you can argue the game in a court when, you're, when your position is being challenged. Are we being fair right now? It's a question. <laughs> All right, so Kule, before I go, because time is not with us, we know that elections are over. Uh, Peter Obi and the Labour Party have submitted their petition in the tribunal. Expectation is that there would be a submission from um, Atiku Abarka of the PDP as well, because, of course, the deadline is running uh, on. But at the end of the day, people have now started talking about healing. Let's move on. We have a president-elect. Let's join hands and move Nigeria forward. When you hear people talk about moving forward and healing, have we skipped a few steps in asking people to move on from, even in Lagos State, some of the situations that the state found itself involved in? Are, are we moving too fast when we haven't really even agreed that there are scars and wounds that have been inflicted in this election season? The truth is, there cannot be peace without justice. They walk hand in hand. So you can't just say, okay, yeah, I hit you on the face. But you know what? In the interest of peace, mm -hmm. let's move forward. I would always carry it in, the scars in my heart. Somebody has to pay. And this is not for maybe to punish someone. It's to show that there are consequences for these actions. As long as we don't show there are consequences for these actions, we're going to have them repetitive and continuous. What stops me from being dangerous in 2027? All I need to do is organize, meet, have some access to some touts, have like maybe 20,000 touts, equip them with things, and then get them to do things I want them to do because they're allowed. And we can't, this cannot be a nation. So if Nigeria wants to remain a country, which it is, Nigeria can do the things and continue to allow the things happen. But if Nigeria wants to become a nation like the top nations of the world, mm. there must be credibility in its election. And that can only be brought by justice. And that can only be brought by justice. Kunle, a fantastic place uh, to end the conversation tonight. I've been speaking with Kunle Lawal, the executive director of the Electoral College Nigeria. As we continue to review and analyze the events of Saturday's election, March 18th, where Nigerians voted for governors and state houses of assembly members. Of course, that just feeds off the presidential and national assembly elections that happened on February the 25th. These conversations will continue for a while because there is accountability. There are, of course, reviews uh, and postmortems to be done to see how Nigeria can better the process and, of course, encourage better democracy and governance as the country continues on. The largest democracy in Africa, the most populous black nation on earth, and, of course, the largest economy on the African continent. There is a lot at stake. That's up. That's it for me here for Politics HQ tonight. Do have a fantastic evening. Don't forget that we'll be back your way at 7 p.m. West African time and at 9 p.m. West African time. NC Continental Prime comes your way. I'm Tolu Lokwe, Adela Ruth Balogun. Have a fantastic evening. <laughs>